Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here this evening rather than at dinner or going out or wherever else you could be. Um, I'm going to do my very best to make it worth your while. Uh, so as, um, as, as, uh, as he mentioned, uh, my name is Julie. I am at Adwell Group. And I joined as um, their director of product for their self-service uh, product, uh, really building out the UI and like the in-product experience for customers that sign up for themselves, uh, don't have an account manager or anything. And um, recently, I took on a role with a wider scope, uh, heading up online sales and operations, which has purview over the product and marketing, analytics, and um, uh, and, and sales, like all working together to build kind of the customer experience because among many other lessons that I'm going to share in uh, our time here today, um, product is really only part of the customer experience. And as we talk about um, the title of this presentation is how to optimize act activation as a PM, um, I, uh, some of the unconventional tips that I have are really about thinking outside of the product. So. Quick plug for Adwell Group and Adwell. Adwell Group is a technology uh, platform that allows companies to grow their business. Um, uh, within Adwell Group, we have two business units aimed at serving two distinct types of customers. The Rollworks business unit is a growth platform for B2B companies who want uh, technology that can help them efficiently and cost-effectively find like named account lists. Uh, everyone who does purchasing at these types of companies. Uh, Adwell, on the other hand, is a growth platform for ambitious e-commerce uh, companies, uh, businesses that grew up online that want to kind of grow sometimes uh, beyond what their like financial means would typically allow kind of in the olden days of advertising. Um, Google and Facebook would dearly like to say that they are the one-stop shop for um, advertising online for anything that a business would want to do online. Uh, but AdRoll's advantage is we uh, are one-stop shop really to buy across Google and Facebook and about a million other and change uh, sites um, online. And because we have one bidder across everything, uh, we make sure you're not competing uh, against yourselves. Um, so that was a mouthful. And AdRoll really is actually one of the most complex products that I've had uh, an opportunity to build and manage over my career. Um, I've worked in marketing and product and growth product across uh, B2B and B2C companies um, from incredibly simple mobile app download uh, uh, apps all the way to the very complex online advertising platform that I've just described. And so, um, I want to share uh, some of the most actionable as well as some of the most like unconventional lessons that I've learned over my time. Raise your hands if you've seen some version of this chart before. All right, so uh, this is kind of like the mission statement or like the, the Bible of um, growth. Uh, it is the customer life cycle funnel, the customer acquisition funnel, call it what you will. Um, but it's a good framework for figuring out where in your um, product growth strategy that uh, you're losing customers. Um, so what step do companies typically get told to focus on? What's that? Retention, acquisition, retention. I hear mostly, I hear mostly retention and, and acquisition. Um, in my career, I've always been told retention. Uh, many people have seen the kind of leaky bucket analogy where why pour tons and tons of people in if they're all just going to leak out of the other end. And it makes logical sense to focus on retention, uh, but to be unconventional, I'd say reten focusing on retention is a bad idea for a couple of reasons. One is it's really slow. Focusing on retention takes too much time. Retention, by definition, means that someone who signed up or started using your product is still using it 30 days later, three months later, sometimes up to a year later. 
um, <clears throat> which is a very, very long time to wait to see if the results of an experiment that you ran or a feature that you launched had some level of impact. So uh, optimizing retention and experiments that focus specifically on retention take too much time. Uh, it's a really an effect and like not a, a net cause. Um, if you're optimizing retention, you're really um, addressing the kind of the effect that your existing product experience has already had on your customers. Uh, you're treating kind of the uh, symptoms or like the effect of whatever product experience that you've already built rather than like the underlying um, uh, disease or the underlying kind of cause for the way that um, customers feel about your product by the time they get uh, seven or 14 days or 30 days down the road. Um, companies really, really love to talk about reducing churn, for instance. There's even a good name for it. It's called the win back program. Uh, who doesn't want to win back customers? Um, there's uh, all sorts of strategies you can do to win back customers. You, when they pause, uh, uh, camp spending money with you or when they stop using your product, you can ask them, hey, why did you do that? And you can analyze all the data and then you can run all the numbers and you can figure out, oh, this is the reason. Um, by the way, we fixed this comeback. Uh, but at that point, it's almost like um, an employee at the company has decided to like leave already and you're trying to counter with a counter offer, but kind of their mindset is already set. It's kind of a little bit too late. Uh, and finally, retention assumes customer desirability, uh, which seems like it wouldn't be controversial. Like a customer should be desirable. You want customers to come back. Um, but one point that I'm going to keep emphasizing uh, throughout this uh, talk is you don't want all customers. Um, Adwell is a company that's been around for 12 years. Uh, we're still privately funded. We like to say we are the like longest living startup like ever. And when we started out, most of our customers were small self-service uh, advertisers. And then as we started to grow and as larger advertisers started to see, hey, this is a great platform. I want to use it. We started hearing this kind of pitch over and over again. Hey, I really want to use your product but I really need this feature. I really need feature X. I'll give you a million dollars and if you give me feature X. So the product team stops working on whatever they were working on, shifts, builds that feature, um, wants to launch it quickly, so maybe they make it an admin-only feature on a different code base than the actual product itself, and push it out to the, pro to the customer. The customer may or may not use it, spends maybe a quarter of the amount of money that they said they would, and then they leave and they don't come back. Um, that has happened more than once at both Adwell as well as like other companies that I've been in the past. Um, it's called chasing whales, and it's uh, typically not um, a great strategy unless it's like something that your company has like been built from the ground up to do, like only going after the big um, customers. For us, chasing those whales uh, resulted in us kind of losing sight of who our actual target customer was in the first place, and we were not kind of serving their needs. So kind of a myopic focus on retention can kind of um, get you in trouble if you don't start out with kind of like a really good definition of who your target customer actually is. So I propose... Um, starting rather than at the end, at retention, uh, flipping it and starting at the beginning. So you start first by defining your target customer. You get your activation right. The title of this talk is How to Optimize Activation as a PM. And I think, I believe, it is the most important step to optimize in the uh, user growth funnel. And then you verify whether you've gotten your activation right with retention. Retention is the effect of like proper um, activation. So three unconventional methods for optimizing activation. 
Who has heard before, if you want people to activate, simplify your page? Everybody, everybody. Um, I subscribed to this for the longest time. I used to teach a course on introduction to growth hacking, and one of the things I really loved to say was uh, you want to reduce cognitive load. Like if you have a call to action button on your site and you have a video to watch, the person, uh, the prospective customer will choose the easier task to do. They will watch the video and then they will not sign up for your product. So like remove every single possible bit of extraneous information from your site, which is right up to a certain point. Um, I would rather say not simplify your page uh, all the way. I would, I would rather subscribe to what a pretty smart person said, which is um, make everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. There's a point at which um, you, it, you're not reducing cognitive load for your customers, prospective customers, by removing things off your page, but you're actually adding like uncertainty. And let, let me tell you a bit more about it, what I mean. So rather than simplify your page, I propose and say my first unconventional method for optimizing activation is to add positive friction. Positive friction is when you purposefully make your activation process less efficient, less user friendly, quote unquote, or like slower on purpose in order to um, provide in the end a better experience for your customers. Uh, so let's go through some examples. Uh, this one that's on the next page might not look like you're adding positive friction. In fact, it looks like the most simple page ever. Um, this is the website for a media planning agency that I used to work with at a previous company. It's not their homepage. It's their website. It's their entire website. There's, there's nothing else on their site. And... Um, I had heard about them like kind of via a referral, and so I'd never seen their website. But when I saw it, <laughs> I was a bit perplexed, and I said, You're, why do you have such a terrible website? There's nothing on there for me. And they say, our website is not terrible. <laughs> it is, in fact, the result of many stages of actually A-B testing. We used to have lots of case studies on the site. We used to describe exactly what it was that we did to our customers. And then we realized that um, we described examples of what we did to our customers. And then we realized that all the inquiries that we were getting were for that exact thing and for nothing else. Whereas what we like to do is provide customized media plans. And so we wanted to remove any sort of uh, reasons that a customer could say, uh, maybe not for me. Maybe it's not for me. So instead, you just throw an email up there, and then the customer has to take the time to write out what it is. Hey, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for this, this, this. Can you do this for me? At which point, then, uh, Chong and Coster, the agency, can say, yes, this is exactly what we do. I'm so glad this is exactly what you're looking for. Um, this is totally in our agency's uh, wheelhouse. Um, but you'll notice that they, they, they don't make it that they don't make it templatized for someone to send them an inquiry. They don't try and make it too easy for them. They want to hear only from people who want to take the time and really think about what it is that they want this agency to do for them. So uh, that was a B2B example. We'll go to a B2C example. There are certain uh, sites and certain products where all you want to do is remove as many elements from the page as possible. If I'm downloading a mobile game, I don't want to know absolutely everything about your mobile game. I just want to download it and I'll try it out and I'll decide if I like it or not. If I don't like it, I'll just delete it. It's a very, very low bar barrier to entry for me to try a product. On the other hand, um, for more high consideration products or for products that Maybe I need a little more confidence in the, um, in the uh, company. Uh, what I need to know is not like, what I need to know is give me reasons that I should trust you. Uh, cognitive load to me is uncertainty. I don't know if I trust this site. I don't know if I want to use it. So the way to actually reduce this cognitive load is 
um, paradoxically, by putting as many reasons on the site as possible that I should trust them. So um, what do you see on this site that tells me as a brand new customer, that signals to me as a brand new customer that I should trust this site, that Credit Karma knows what they're talking about? You might think that you're signing up for a trial that then like automatically subscribes you to something, but this is actually like truly, truly free. How many times do they say free on this page? Like a lot. I'm probably a little concerned about my security. So in addition to um, kind of the, uh, the, the social proof that these um, new sites provide, uh, there's little symbols like that little lock secure icon on login. Um, there is evidence that Credit Karma has invested in um, uh, content and advice, tools and advice, um, to show that they're not just a random site. They've, this is actually all that they do and that they focus on like, providing customers um, advice on what to do with their credit score. Many, many signals that they're giving. So even though this page looks busy, what they're trying to do is to remove as many doubts from the customer's mind that would prevent them from signing up. So positive friction. About a year ago, Adroll held a customer advisory board where we invited a lot of our um, high spending customers as well as customers that had spent a lot on our platform before but no longer were uh, to tell us like what they thought. And this was some feedback that a uh, business gave us when we asked them what their like experience was signing up for AdRoll, um, what we could do better. And it was very puzzling uh, when I initially heard this uh, because we had um, invested a lot of time in trying to make the sign sign on process, the activation process, as easy as possible. Um, our activation process was like a three item checklist around like place this pixel, um, tell us what your budget is, upload like a couple of assets, like a logo, an image, et cetera, and we will um, magically generate campaigns for you. And there was a lot of magic that we purposely hid from the customers because we thought it would be um, honestly magical for them to give us like just the bare minimum information and we would suddenly create something uh, fully featured for them. Uh, what we weren't weren't showing to them was, hey, after you place the pixel, um, uh, we like are crawling your site so we know like how many visitors come to your site so we know in general how much uh, you can spend per month. We know which visitors are more valuable. We know which visitors are less valuable. We know what your site is about. Uh, we know what type of services or products that you sell. So there was a lot of things that were happening behind the scenes based on really powerful technology that we were not making visible to the customer because we thought they didn't need to see it. Simple sign-on page was uh, all they should want to see. But in fact, um, it made our customers less confident in what it was that we're doing. They thought, you haven't asked me any sort of personal questions. How can you possibly know what my business needs? Every single business thinks of themselves as incredibly unique. A um, apparel site, uh, wants a plan that is different from what we would offer a travel site. And a very specific apparel site probably wants a strategy that's different from all other apparel sites out there because they are really, really the unique ones. Every single business thinks that they're unique. So by simplifying the whole process down, we were in fact uh, driving less confidence in our customers that we kind of knew what we were doing. So we put a whole bunch more questions into the activation flow, including like, tell us what your industry is, tell us how big your company is, tell us in general like how much you want to spend on how much you spend on other uh, advertising platforms. And to start, we didn't use any of that information in putting together um, the, the, the um, campaign. Uh, but just by asking those questions, uh, the customers already felt like we were giving them a personalized plan. And eventually we followed that up with like real customized uh, campaigns for one vertical over another, one company size over another. So um, there is 
a desire always that when a customer signs up for your product or wants to use their product, that your product is something that is right for them. All right, unconventional method number two. Is any customer a good customer? Uh, we've already gone over this, so hopefully uh, I've led you to the answer. No. Uh, that said, if you're a startup, you're just starting out, you haven't found product market fit, obviously you want every single customer you can possibly have. Like, more data points is better than no data points. Um, but once you get to the point that you've found what your product market fit is, you really need to begin focusing on your target customer up to the point of actually turning non-target customers away. This might mean that your sign up to activation rate will go down, which is uh, very nerve wracking for most growth product managers or for most growth marketers because they've been taught, I was taught, to, to optimize certain metrics. Uh, this key performance indicator is the indicator of how well I'm doing. But it's not a, it's, a, it's not called a user acquisition funnel, an entire process for nothing. It's an entire process, not just one step in it. So you may have a, <clears throat> a lower sign up to activation rate, but if the people or the customers that get through end up spending more, end up, spend, it end up sticking around longer, it may in fact be worth it for you. Onboarding is like a first date. Uh, neither of you, uh, you should not be promising a experience in your onboarding process that the, uh, your product cannot sustain in the long term. Neither you nor the customer wants to end up in that situation. Um, so here's an example. Uh, Adol is meant for companies that dare to grow. And uh, this sounds just like marketing speak, but then it actually cascades down to who our target customer is. They are small companies who are willing to invest a sizable amount in their business. Like they're not dipping their toe in the water for online advertising. They already know the value of online advertising and they're willing to spend a lot of money. Um, Adol's target customer is not the same as us. Uh, sorry, did I say Adol? AdWords. <laughs> the AdWords target customer is not the same as AdRoll. Google AdWords is usually any business's first foray into online advertising. And um, they will take every single mom and pop business that they can get. And they will say, and they will draw them in by saying, uh, hey, you can spend as little as $10 per day. Uh, we're approachable. We're for single person run businesses. Um, and for a while, Adol tried to match what Google was doing. Uh, we tried to say, hey, you can spend as little as $10 per day. Um, but what we found is, um, first, just based on how our tech ran, $10 per day was not enough to get significant results. And the, the customers who um, spent less or set lower budget amounts, they tended, obviously, to spend much less. And they actually stuck around a lot less, a lot shorter than customers with higher budgets because the product itself was just not built for really, really low spending um, customers. And um, so we raised our budget uh, recommendation to $50 per day. You can still spend less. Uh, we don't kick you out if, for example, you only end up spending $10 per day, but putting this number out anchors the customer or the prospective customer's um, uh, expectation of what it takes to be successful on our platform. Um, so this did result in a decreased sign up to activation rate, but the amount of increased spend that each successful advertiser then had and the increased longevity of each one of those customers that we had, they more than uh, made up for it. Third unconventional method, um, product managers and growth product managers especially, uh, and this is called product school. So um, it's easy to fall into the assumption that the product is equal to the customer experience and you spend all of your time optimizing what the customer's experience is when they're within your product. And um, I would wager to say that in reality, Product is only 50% or honestly less uh, of the story. So I um, uh, signed up 
tried to sign up for a subscription product the other day that will remain unnamed. The um, sign-up process, the activation process, involved a 30-question like survey. It was really, really long, really, really detailed. And I'm sure they had a very, very good reason for wanting that much information from me. Um, and so I got through like maybe five of the questions before uh, running out of time and thinking, I'll pick it up again tomorrow. I didn't. Life got in the way. And then uh, a day later, I got an email from this, from this company and saying, hey, uh, uh, it was obviously a reminder email. And like the growth product manager in me was like, oh, this is good. I'm very glad that they're reminding me to do this. And then I saw the subject line. It said, wasn't that easy to finish activation today? And that really just soured me on the entire experience. It was very clear that either the email drip campaign was written completely separately from the product team that designed the product, or the product team was just completely um, like tone deaf and did not know what the actual customer experience was like. Either way, uh, not very good news for my impression um, of the product uh, itself. So product is one touch point with your customers. Emails are another touch point uh, with your customers. Uh, customer support, knowledge base, your help center, right? Um, social media, PR. Uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg gave a great manifesto, a great talk about uh, how Facebook was going to change its algorithm and focus on relationships and not focus on advertisers. Unfortunately, this uh, talk happened like one week after Cambridge Analytica or something. So yeah, not really uh, uh, the, the same message there. And then your website itself. The website and your onboarding process, they're usually owned by two separate people and, or two separate teams. And a lot of companies, they say something very different on their website than they do on uh, the sign-up process, usually for one specific reason, which is that the website is owned by marketing, and it's marketing's job to talk about what your product could be, what the potential of the product is, uh, what the ideal version of the product is, because that draws people in. And then the onboarding process is meant to be what the product is and what you can actually do uh, with the product. And there's always going to be some sort of disconnect there. But like as product managers, you should be thinking about um, how to like kind of lessen the um, the like <clears throat> the disconnect between those two platforms, uh, those two customer touch points. Because from a customer's point of view, they're thinking about every single touch point that they have with you as like part of that experience. Please remember that your activation rate, your sign up to activation rate is not your end goal, right? Neither is your retention rate itself your end goal. These are all guiding metrics. These are all um, ver ways to verify uh, whether or not your target customers are getting value from your product and that you're getting value from those customers in return. So um, you can accelerate your activation rate by um, removing many steps in the onboarding process, but you might be doing so at the expense of uh, driving fewer but more engaged individual customers, so adding positive friction. Um, you can invite all potential customers in um, and then kind of be lured into developing custom features for really, really high spending customers or customers that say that they will spend a lot. Um, or um, you, in that case, you'd be doing your target customers a disservice, or you can be really, really focused on like, I know what customer my product works best for. Um, if you're outside of this profile, you can use the product. We won't, we won't perhaps completely turn you away, but we're not going to cater to that. Um, and then you can be really maniacally focused on improving the in-product experience for a customer and kind of miss out on the broader picture of your customer experience across your marketing channels, your um, PR channels, your social media channels, your support channels. So 
remember if that product is really only like 50% uh, or less of the story. And I hope that uh, by keeping these in mind, um, it can make all of you just a little bit more successful. That would make my day.